Next up this morning, we're going over to the School of Business and Mr. John Marr is going to present for us next, uh, where he's going to explore the integration of residential property and private pensions. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, this, is, uh, this project arose out of a call from the European Commission to examine, I suppose, novel ways for leveraging the capital that's tied up in residential property when people retire. And we responded to that. My background is in the financial services sector, and I drew on contacts that I had over 25 years ago in putting together a team for this project. Uh, the original application was submitted uh, from WIT by Sheila Donoghue, <coughs> Cormac O'Keefe, and myself. Uh, the, sub the submission went through our partners in Hamburg, IFF, which is a research uh, unit um, privately fu funded by projects, essentially, but linked to the University of Hamburg. Uh, <coughs> the submission went in in December 2014. Uh, the project was due to be awarded by March 2015. The project was awarded in June 2015. The project was to start in September 2015. The project started in October 2015. There were capacity issues in Waterford Institute of Technology, and the team changed. Okay, uh, so people, you know, uh, people were at full capacity. So we reconstituted the team. Uh, Dr. Richard Burke and Sean Byrne joined the team, and we recruited a research student, Yogesh Jayawala, who is <coughs> uh, preparing now for his transfer process onto the doctoral stream. So the research consortium consisted of uh, seven partners in six countries. Uh, and I suppose what's significant about it is we have the UK, Germany, Italy, which are all large countries. Uh, all of them have populations which, is, which are aging significantly more than we are in Ireland. We have uh, the Netherlands, Hungary, and Ireland, okay, so which are small populations. We have East and West, large and small, well-developed pe uh, private pension systems, and less well-developed private pension systems. We have new entrants to the European Union, and we have original founding members of the European Union. So all of those things matter in terms of European projects, how you put it together. Uh, um, and in, you know, in, I suppose in the worst case scenario there, you have uh, our Italian partners. In 2050, there could be between six and 10 million Ita less Italians than there are at the moment. Okay, they don't reproduce. Fertility really does matter in terms of the European economy. And in, yeah, we know Germany was very open in terms of its admission of uh, refugees, but it has an economic interest as well in replenishing its workforce. So uh, the contract was awarded by DG Employment and Social Affairs, and we had a requirement to raise additional funding, uh, which was about 20% of the total funding. So I went out with a begging bowl, and I got some contributions from Irish Life, the Pensions Authority, and New Ireland Assurance. In addition, we have cooperated in our technical work with Seniors Money. Uh, it was one of the original sellers of what are called equity release products here in Ireland. Uh, they have been closed for new business for a number of years since the financial crisis, but they hope to re-enter the market shortly. Their technical assistance did matter, and they are also members of the, uh, a group I hadn't heard of until we started this project, the European Proper Pension Property Asset Release Group. And uh, three of the consortium member members, uh, Sebastian Clark Reno, Professor Donald McKillop, and myself went <coughs> over to London to meet with them. And they, uh, they have supported the project in a technical sense over the last two years. So what did we, what did we say we would look? Well, we said we'd look at the constituent elements uh, which determine what property people own when they reach retirement age and also what are their needs in terms of retirement income. And we would investigate to what extent they could access this, you know, the second biggest asset that they own, namely their house or their apartment 
uh, when they retire. Uh, so we, we reviewed the situation in the six countries. Uh, we engaged with uh, market participants. Um, and this is what we promised we would, we would come up, we would develop some proposals which might allow people to either own property in a different way than they do at the moment or to accumulate retirement income in a different way than they do at the moment. Okay? In Ireland, less than half the people in the private sector have a private pension, uh, even though it's public policy that this would go to 70%, but public policy has failed uh, over the last 20 years to make any difference in that regard. We included this, uh, this figure in our application uh, because we wanted to convey to them, the, I suppose, the extent of engagement that would be required over the two years. So when we came to actually address the work <coughs> at individual country level, so what we, we, we did was we met individual stakeholders in Ireland, and that included the revenue commissioners, the central bank, <coughs> the pensions authority, uh, the two life assurance companies that I mentioned, seniors money, the residential tenancy board, and uh, some, some groups which represent pensioners as well. We conducted focus groups in Dublin and Watford to determine what the attitude of individuals are, what their attitudes are to using their homes in retirement to enhance their retirement income. And there's a variety of ways that you can do that. You don't have to use a financial product. You can trade down. You can do a deal with another member of the family. So there are, there are a number of possibilities that don't involve financial products as well. Um, so th those focus groups went on in each of the, so there were 12 focus groups conducted in the initial stage across the six countries. And then when we had developed some possibilities, we met with stakeholders again to get their feedback as to what those possibilities, did they think they would work, to what extent would there be an appetite in the industry or among individual individuals with respect to their own homes. And we also, uh, so we did that in Waterford and we, and we did that in Dublin as well. Um, what we <coughs> so we pulled it all together uh, on Dropbox. It was quite challenging. There were two countries, obviously, ourselves in the UK, uh, who are native speakers and the others then are English as their second language, but English is the language of the financial services sector internationally. So that was a help to us. So, uh, so what... what we have, we have submitted the report now to uh, the European Commission and they're considering it uh, before they allow us to release it. Um, we've bought some books for the library. Uh, we've participated in consortium meetings. In, uh, we hosted one here and our, our friends in Hamburg and our friends in Budapest hosted them as well. We've presented information at conferences and uh, Yogesh has participated and presented in in doctoral colloquia in Waterford and at Lone as well, and at the IFF conference in Valencia. Uh, there will be a book out this year. We'll have a chapter on Ireland. And uh, I, I have myself and Richard have presented in TCD <coughs> this year, and I've presented to the research students in the University of Rostock. We have created a domestic and international network. Uh, we're meeting in Budapest next month to see where can we take it next and Yogesh has taken the work forward hopefully by way of a transfer to the doctoral stream. Thank you very much. Thank you very much John. Does anyone have any questions for John? Oh we few. <laughs> um, you mentioned that people's houses were the second most valuable asset. I yeah. just wonder what the first was. Uh, their pension, their, their existing pension, you know. Seems but as I say, half the people don't have, if they're in the private sector, half the people don't have pensions. Uh, Brian? Or aside from the state. Uh, you touched on at the end, um, the getting impact from this research, getting the research output. Yeah. Uh, so in my own discipline in design, the research outputs are non-traditional. They don't easily get captured by publications and et cetera. You have to... Yeah. You have to kind of shoehorn them in. Yeah. Um, and here you seem like you're actually coming up with a, a kind of a design solution or almost a product or an offering, which again doesn't neatly fit into that publication framework. How are you getting impact out of, out of the work? Because 
How are, you, how are you getting the impact out of the research work that's in place here? Okay, well, uh, in the first instance, it's gone to the European Commission, which is respons has responsibility for, I suppose, standards and regulation within the, within the sector. Uh, the second thing is I've contacted the European Commission office in Dublin, and they have a space which you can use for engagement with the public and stakeholders on European, on European projects. It doesn't, it's free, uh, but you, ha you have to look after it. And uh, what we hope to do is when the Commission allows us to disseminate the report, then we will host an event in Dublin and we'll invite uh, people from Social Protection, uh, Insurance Ireland, uh, groups representing the retired people, uh, the financial services sector, and we will make a presentation on the report and hopefully we'll have the book available uh, at the same time, and we can use it to launch the book in Ireland uh, in conjunction with Springer. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. <laughs> so, um,